Welcome to the show again to the Paducah Human Rights Commission Raising the Standard and I am Commissioner Shalon Jeter and I have a co-host with me today Commissioner Matthew Schultz. Welcome Matthew. Hi, glad to be here. Um, and we have some special guests here also uh, the Maneas, Mr. and Mrs. Manea and Mr. and Mrs. Bloomingberg and we have um, What's Chrissy's last name? Ramey. Chrissy Ramey, and we've got some really interesting guests on our show today. Before we uh, begin the program, I would like to talk to you about the mission. At the Paducah Human Rights Commission, we basically do not want anyone to be discriminated against, and if you feel like you've been discriminated, please contact our office. Um, some ways you may be discriminated will be uh, against age, religion, uh, disability, color, race, gender, um, sexual orientation, or national origin. And please feel free to call our office. I believe our contact number is on the screen. It's 270-444-8643. Um, and just contact us. You, there's a simple little form you need to fill out. But again, we're going to go ahead and jump right in. And Commissioner Schultz, we're so glad to have you here today. Happy to be here. Um, and we have Mr. and Mrs. Tabitha and Seth Manea, welcome. Hi. Thank you for having us. Um, so we're just going to jump in. Seth and Tabitha have been married for, how long have you guys been married? Just over a year, a year and three months. Okay, and mm -hmm. uh, Tabitha uh, has a disease called osteogenesis imperfecta, mm -hmm. which means in brittle bone disease, in layman's terms, is that correct? Yes. Okay, yeah. and... So we just want to talk to you about life and how it impacts your life and, and you know, the things that you do every day. Um, how did you guys meet? Uh, <laughs> we met at church camp and I was in sixth grade and I think he was in seventh. Yeah. Sixth grade? Yeah. Wow. Known each other for quite some time, I guess. Yeah, we've known, known each yeah. other for a little while. <laughs> <laughs> and you just got married a year ago. Mm -hmm. Now I understand that um, Tabitha, you were on a national TV show. What was that mm -hmm. show? Uh, it's called Randy to the Rescue. Randy to the Rescue. Yeah. Um, and tell us about that program. Um, it's kind of like a spinoff of Say Yes to the Dress. That's on TLC. Uh -huh. um, one of the. I don't know what he's called. Like a one of the helpers on the show. Randy. Yes. He. Um, got the side job and so what he does is he would travel in like a big um, a semi truck, semi -truck a big full rig. of wedding dresses and he would go and help people in different areas that couldn't come to the store in New York so wow. we went to Nashville uh -huh. and got to find my wedding there's, dress. There's usually a reason why yeah. uh, you need help finding a dress whether okay. it's you just looked at all of them or in Tabitha's case, she has, you know, her short statu stature. It's uh -huh. hard to find a dress to fit her. Um, but that's what the show is, is based about. You, it, you need help to find a dress. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Um, and I did see the show. And yeah. it was wonderful. Mm -hmm. And you were so beautiful in Thank that you. dress. Um, and it, it, they did a really good job with that. And I remember when I was talking to your husband mm -hmm. about you and coming on to the show, he told me something really profound that I really thought was really nice. Seth, do you remember what you told me that day? Not sure, the, no. The reason that you <laughs> loved your wife? There's plenty of reasons I love my wife. <laughs> but but the, the main thing, and I don't know if it's what you're talking about or not, the main thing is she, you know, she never lets anything get in her way, and she, she doesn't want to be treated differently. She, she does everything just like anyone else would. Mm -hmm. um, and she very rarely complains about it. I believe that's what we were talking about that day. Mm -hmm. And as far as mm -hmm. osteogenesis and perfecta, what exactly is that? You want um, It's a, my mind. It's a, uh, <laughs> basically it's a, it's a genetic mutation yeah, and it, it doesn't allow your body to make collagen that your bones need to be okay. strong. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to do with the uh, calcium deficiency or anything. Now, taking calcium and vitamin D, and it helps. It helps. Um, but until adolescence is uh, when it's really the roughest time, your bones break easily, even coughing or sneezing can cause you to break a rib. Or So being a kid and falling down and playing with other kids, it's, it's tough, um, a tough childhood. But now that she's an adult, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. Her bones are a little stronger. The bone density is uh, better than normal. Uh, but that's basically what it is, is brittle bones. And wow, okay. It's a it's pretty rare disease. Did you have those problems when you were a child? Yeah, um, I broke a lot. I don't know how many times, but. The several. It, yeah. Now but now, I'm, I'm, I haven't broken anything in a couple of years, so. Okay, wonderful. Yeah. Now, I read somewhere, um, can you lose your hearing or something? Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. and yeah, because your bone actually has a, your ear actually has a bone in it. Mm -hmm. And that's what, over time, the bone degenerates and you can lose some hearing because of that. Okay. So you have to worry about when you get older and your, your mm -hmm. bones have less density at that time mm -hmm. too? Is that an issue you got to mm -hmm. be concerned with? Yep. One thing, um, when I first met you, it seemed like nothing st could stop you. And, mm -hmm. and for your husband to say, that's one of the things that he loved about you is that you did that you do not have this as a, a crutch. Because a mm -hmm. lot of times people have things as a crutch. You know, I can't do this because of this or this or that. But um, you didn't let that stop you. And I've heard people say, um, I think I heard Jensen Franklin say this one time. He had said, he, this guy had a disease and the doctor told me he had this disease. So he didn't believe he had this disease. And this guy was running marathons or whatnot, whatnot. Long story short, the guy did not have the disease. But another person, the doctor said he had the disease and physically he didn't have it. So mm -hmm. I think this mind thing, your mindset is what helps you. Mm -hmm. I think that's what helps you. Now, what do you do? I mean, are you limited on things? Can you work? Can you drive? I do both of those. I have a full-time job. Uh -huh. um, I'm a production lead at the company I work for, uh -huh. and I also drive just a normal car. You could drive so a normal car. Mm -hmm. Well, That's it's a normal car, but it's got a. It's got modifications. It's got modifications to it. to it, but it's, I mean, pretty simple. It's got a platform with its own pedals that connect to the regular pedals, and she can drive just like anyone else. So, did you get your license at 16? No, <laughs> <laughs> I had to wait till I was 18. Okay. But um. And and that was because of uh, voc rehab. Mm -hmm. Voc rehab with voc rehab in Kentucky, there's money there um, that helps you learn how to drive. Helps you get somebody to train you to drive. But uh, oh, okay. you have to be 18 to receive that, uh, if I'm if I'm not mistaken. But that was one of the reasons behind that. And they actually helped provide the uh, modifications for our first car. So they helped wow. get those installed. Mm -hmm. And okay. Does yeah. voc mean vocational? Yeah. Vocational mm -hmm. rehab. That's mm -hmm. wonderful. Was that here in Paducah? Mm -hmm. Yeah, down at the uh, Career Center the Unemployment Office. Um, they had someone and they also helped with her college books and things like that. That's wonderful. Now, mm -hmm. did you go to college, Tabitha? Yeah, I came to WKCTCS for three years. Uh -huh. so, and then I went to Murray State for two. Okay, wonderful. Mm -hmm. do, you have a, do you have your degree yet? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I finished back in 2011 with um, my bachelor's in business. Wonderful, oh, wonderful. Yeah. I have to ask this question though. Seth, can you drive that car? Yeah, <laughs> I, I can. No, it's, it's a really, like I said, it's a simple setup. There's, you remove a couple pins and it all comes out and I could put it in the trunk and drive a car just, you know, because it, it then becomes a normal car, mm -hmm. pedals and everything. Have you ever had any issues where you couldn't do something because there wasn't an accommodation for you or at a public place or at, you know, any private place or mm. you don't have to be specific, just. Not, well, there's always going to be. Well, like shopping and stuff, yeah. like grocery shopping, you know, right. she can't reach stuff on the higher shelf. She's yeah. had to ask strangers for <laughs> help with things, but mm -hmm. yeah, just <laughs> yeah. But not too much. That's good, and yeah. I like how you said not too much. Mm -hmm. That's really good, because um, I'm tall, and mm. I could. Because I remember when I came in today, Schultz, Commissioner Schultz says, "Were well, you the tallest one?" Here? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I like that attitude. Yeah. Nothing is going to stop stop mm -hmm. you, you know. Mm -hmm. And and people are different. Everybody's mm -hmm. different. Everybody has a hang up or a flaw, you know. Um, and I think that's, that was one of the reasons we wanted to do this show because we wanted people to see just because someone is different mm -hmm. that they're still a person, that they still can be productive. Right. 
Mm -hmm. um, when you go when you go out to dinner, do mm -hmm. you how do you handle when people stare or look? I just ignore Most of the time, you just ignore them. Or just smile back and, and like wave to them. And let them and then know. They're like, let they them know you weird. saw them. <laughs> and then they kind of feel un uncomfortable, yeah. maybe <laughs> not look as much. But uh -huh. it happens. That's just human nature. They look and want to see something that's different. They don't understand it most of the time. Basically, that's what it comes down to is they just don't understand people being different. And right. we're all different. Right. We may not look it, you know, on the outside, but we're all different. I, I think that's the key because even mm -hmm. um, like a mixed couple, uh, a white guy and a black girl mm -hmm. or vice versa, people just look, mm -hmm. you know, especially, you know, in some smaller areas, they, they just tend to stare. What? You know, but hey, love is love. Yeah. And people are people. And, and that's, you know, again, that's why we want to do this show. Well, Schultz, you've been pretty quiet. Do you have any questions for them or comments? <laughs> um. What's your family life like? Do you guys have oh, yeah. kids or anything? No kids. Or, no. No. It's just we us. We both have pretty big families, so. Yeah. Okay. A lot of, she's got a lot of nieces Niece and nephews on her side. And then I've, I have a twin brother. Um, and then I have, let me count, five adopted siblings okay. right oh. now. So, and they're all younger. So they're, my little sisters could actually be our kids. And right. it was kind of funny. We've had them out in public before my little, sister the oldest of the sisters when she was a baby we had her out at the mall and people <laughs> thought she was ours uh, she's from china she's from china, china. Okay. okay they just they kind of thought she was ours yeah um, now tabitha where are you from <laughs> i'm from seoul south korea okay yeah. and how long have you been in in america um my parents adopted me when i was eight months old so okay wonderful for my now, whole life <laughs> Go, go ahead. That's like pretty much my whole life. I've been raised here in Paducah. So. Really? Mm -hmm. Okay. Seoul to Paducah. Yeah. It happens all the time. I can't yeah. tell you how many people on this show <laughs> have moved from Seoul. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, you both met at church camp. You're mm -hmm. still active in the church? Uh, uh, we, maybe. we go uh, to Reedland. We go to Reedland Baptist. We don't, okay. we just, we met at um, Southland Baptist Temple. Okay. Uh, and basically, I saw her. Like I said, people look, people are different, and you know, I just was attracted to her, wanted to be friends, and right. we got her number, and, and then we kept running <laughs> into each other everywhere else. And with my parents adopting and her being adopted, my parents were at some adoption groups, and we just mm -hmm. saw each other there. So right. we just stayed in touch and. She's she's mm -hmm. a very beautiful lady, very nice personality. I can understand. Very Thank good. You. you did good. Now, <laughs> that, now, where do you work? You work, right? Well, I, that's all I ever do is work. <laughs> uh, I work at UPS part time, uh -huh. and then I work with Century Twenty One, uh -huh. uh, selling real estate. Uh, and I mean, I I stay pretty busy. Uh, that's good. That's good in the type. Of, yeah. 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 <laughs> Very good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, how do you want um, people to see you? If you're out somewhere, how do you want people to view you? When some, you know what I'm saying? If you're out, how do you want people to view you? Just, just like everybody else. Just like everybody else. Mm -hmm. Very good. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, being different is so what? We're we're all different. Right. We're all different. Like a, a big word, in a lot of you know, disability groups and um, minorities and such is, is normal. It's a, sometimes it's a no-no yeah. uh, is being like everybody else, just a normal person, but there really is no normal. Everyone's different. Uh, so we all, you know, be looked at as the same. We're, we're all people. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you, have you ever went to like a support group or anything? Have you ever mm -hmm. needed something like that? Yeah, we, we have. Just, we just got back. This summer, um, the bone disease that I have, they have a convention like every other two years. And so it's a time when we all can get together and just meet new people that have this, you know, the same condition oh, okay. as you. And then um, you can also go to different, they're like sessions, mm -hmm. um, different topics uh, about the disease and like new, um, any new studies that the doctors are working on or anything that they've found. Um, I don't know, it's a really good 
time to meet do, people. Do they have a website? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's actually, I believe it's oif.org. It's okay. the uh, Osteogenesis Imperfecta uh -huh. organization. They, uh, there's a lot of resources and information on there. Um, and it's a, it's a nonprofit organization. You, you know, donate and, and so forth. Um, but we have a good time when we go to those conventions and we meet mm -hmm. new people. We've met people from all over. We've, we've got more friends from there than we do here at home. So it's really neat. And how mm -hmm. often do they I meet? Mean, is that once a year? It's or every two, two years. years. Once every two mm -hmm. years. So okay. we're looking forward to Orlando, not next year, but the next. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. I didn't even know there was such a, mm -hmm. uh, a group like that. Mm -hmm. It's really good. How often do you run into people with outside of that with osteogenita imperfecta? Well, here, I don't know any other. I've met one person here, and that was in Calvert City. Uh -huh. I met, and uh, someone noticed the bracelet I was wearing, and they said, well, what's that bracelet for? And I said, it's for mm -hmm. osteogenesis imperfecta. And she was just taken back. She said, I have osteogenesis imperfecta. Wow. And uh, so it was just neat. Mm -hmm. uh, is that what that bracelet is for? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's uh, a little mine's worn out. It's worn on here. Oh, quite okay, well, yeah. But, uh, Does it say anything? It uh -huh. says unbreakable spirit because that's their. That's the osteogenesis imperfecta. That's their motto, motto. Unbreakable spirit. Oh. Now they may their bones may break, but they have an unbreakable spirit. And if you meet, you know, if you've met Tabitha or, or meet anyone else with OI, it's it must come with the disease because it, <laughs> you just. <laughs> I mean, is it helpful to go out and meet other people with osteogenesis mm -hmm. yeah. too? Yeah, you, they you can know, relate to things. Well, a lot of the doctors don't even know if she has, you know, she has these issues or symptoms and she'll ask her doctor, you know, as well as that because of OI and they just, so they don't know. But when you get around people with OI and you talk to them and it, it's just kind of, oh, well, I have that too. Well, that happens to me. And, and so you kind of learn a lot from each other. Okay. You find it's hard to find medical treatment around here because a lot of the physicians aren't familiar um, with what's... Locally, what's yes, because I don't, none of my like specialist doctors, mm -hmm. I, I go to Vanderbilt. Mm -hmm. so, okay. Um, which I'm used to having to go elsewhere because I used to go to Lexington mm -hmm. at their Shriners. Mm -hmm. um, but then when you hit adulthood, they kind of... <laughs> push you out so now I'm at Vanderbilt and um, they just started a new uh, I don't know it's like a new center uh -huh. for specifically for osteogenesis oh, imperfecta wow. so that'll come to good use. That may be something that we may need to follow up in the mm -hmm. future. Um, surely there's some, some doctors here in Paducah we may not know um, if who they are mm -hmm. but that may be something we need to yeah, follow that, up with. That would yeah. be good information to have. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Manea, I want to thank you so much for mm -hmm. just shining a light on this disease and just shining a light on into your life. Um, we're going to be back again with uh, Mr. and Mrs. Bob Bloomingberg and we'll see you in a moment. Thank All you so right. much for thank coming. You. Thank you for having us. We're back. This is the Purdue Human Rights Commission show, Raising the Standard, and uh, we're here today with Bob and Janet Bloomingberg. As you know, Purdue Human Rights Commission is a resource for individuals who face discrimination on the basis of uh, race, gender, sexual orientation, religion, ethnicity, or disability. And uh, Bob and Janet are here to talk to us today about some of the challenges they face having a daughter with autism, and some of the challenges their daughter faces as well. So. Welcome, Welcome to the show. Thanks. Thanks. Glad to be here and glad for the opportunity to try to explain a disorder that is can be very strange and a lot of people don't understand. Right. What's your daughter's name? Uh, her name is Grace, uh, Anna Grace. We call her call her Grace and uh, she just turned 18. Wow. And so um, Now, how long have you two been married? We have been married for 24 years. All right. Congratulations. 24 years. We were married when we were 6. <laughs> <laughs> Right out of college, and uh, we went five years with, without children, and then our first daughter, Grace, was born in okay. 1996. And, uh, you know, when she, when she was first born, she, that's one thing about autism is it looks, they look normal. 
Right. They don't have, right. they're not like a lot of mental disabilities where you can tell in their face maybe mm -hmm. that there's something wrong. So it wasn't until Grace was about two that we started noticing some communication issues. And then when she was two and a half, she was actually diagnosed with autism. So what did you notice? Well, autism is a, is a, is a neurological disorder that primarily uh, inhibits a child or an adult's ability to communicate. There's a lot more to it, but uh, there's, there's something in their brain that, that prohibits them from being able to either understand or to be able to communicate. So I often liken it to being if you were suddenly plopped down in the middle of India or China and you couldn't communicate right. with anybody. So, you know, it, at her age, she spoke early, mm -hmm. but we noticed um, probably when she was about one, when she started talking, if you would ask her a question like you would a normal child, say, what are you doing? Rather than saying, I'm playing, she would just repeat the question back to you, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. It's called echolalia, and uh, it's something that a lot of um, autistic children will do because they can't communicate. They know they're supposed to say something, and they're frustrated. Um, so, Janet, do you want to talk about some of the other symptoms we noticed? Well, like you said, um, it, typically uh, you don't really notice much with autism until they start doing the <coughs> developmental things that they should be doing, say, around the age of one, where right. they should be saying a few words. So, of course, we notice the communication difficulty. Many don't speak at all mm -hmm. um, in the first few years, but because she had language, we didn't, that wasn't really a big red flag to us. Mm -hmm. I think what was probably a bigger sign is her lack of being able to develop relationships with peers. Um, she wouldn't make eye contact very well. Uh, she kind of just treated you like you were an object in a room mm -hmm. rather than a real person. So that was, you know, um, fixation on certain objects that aren't really appropriate. Like she'd rather sit in a corner and play with a string or line toys up. Um, that can be also a common feature. Right. If you give a normal child a um, maybe a, a train or a car, they'll play with it and roll it, whereas an autistic child might just line them up and make a pattern mm -hmm. out of it. So uh, one thing that's very important that we need to bring out is that autism is considered what's called a spectrum disorder, which means there's a wide degree of severity. Um, our daughter, Grace, is more on the severe end. Um, a lot of children who are severely autistic cannot even speak. They'll just kind of make maybe grunting noises. They, right. they can't even talk. Um, our daughter Grace is able to speak, but it's it's fairly nonsensical in that you can't really understand what she's saying. Um, on the higher end of the spectrum, um, a lot of times it's referred to as Asperger's syndrome. And uh, children like that still have a lot of problems, but they aren't nearly as severe as our, our daughter. I think that one of the big differentiations between Asperger's syndrome and autism is that typically an Asperger's child doesn't have communication disorder. They may talk about things that aren't appropriate for a child to talk about. They may sound like a little professor or an adult, mm -hmm. but they typically don't have the communication disorder that's a feature with autism. And typically what you see in the media is the higher functioning children, and I'm not trying to downplay the, uh, the challenges they face or right. their parents face, but typically what you see in the media is the higher functioning children. Um, you might see an autistic child that sings the national anthem or is able to do great artwork. Um, and, and that's great, but a, a lot of people with children like ours, th the media doesn't see that because they're so severe. And, and quite honestly, it can be unsettling with a lot of their, a lot of their behaviors. Um, I've actually got a video that I think we're going to show in a minute. It was just about a 10-second clip yes. I took of our daughter Grace uh -huh. just making some of the noises that she mm -hmm. makes and uh, just kind of shows some of the you know, some of the challenges that we as parents face and just in our day-to-day -day life with her. What type of challenges do you think you <coughs> face day-to-day? -day? I mean, obviously there's, there's many of them, but... Um... She has, she will be di mentally disabled for her lifetime. You know, she's probably never going to advance past where she is, so... Um, with but Grace, she features with um, functional mental retardation, which means um, if, you know, we believe that she is intelligent, but she can't really show it because of the communication disorder. She also will um, engage in self-stimulatory behaviors mm -hmm. almost constantly. She does the rocking, the stereotypical things right. that you might see. She does that almost nonstop. She, she, she'll bite herself. Um, she's not usually violent towards other people, uh, but she, she'll do the, the noises that you'll see right. those uh -huh. are called vocal tics and she'll do them because she likes doing them or because she's stressed or you know there's a lot of different reasons why she might be doing that but pretty much everything to answer your question everything that we do revolves around 
what kind of day Grace is having. Um, it, whether or not we can even go out to a restaurant, we don't go to movies anymore, we don't mm -hmm. take her to church or any places because her behaviors are so disruptive at this particular time. Did it get worse over the years? Well, I would say not necessarily other than as she gets older and bigger, it's a little harder for parents to control a child. You know, something yes. that a three-year-old might be making, verbal tics or, or mm -hmm. doing certain things, mm -hmm. is not as bad as an 18-year-old yeah. doing it. And, and she goes through various phases where she'll have a few good weeks and then a few, few bad weeks. Mm -hmm. so. She has difficulty sleeping at night, so we might be up at 2 a.m. and trying to get her back to bed. And, mm -hmm. you know, so, so there's a lot of sleep disruption sometimes involved with us as well. Now, how does this affect you? Uh, you guys personally, are you able to hold a full-time job or? We both work. I work at Paducah Bank. Janet works for the school system and our, our respective employers have been very good about oh, yes. giving us time if we need to travel to hospitals and that sort of thing. Um, it, it's difficult like anybody struggling with as a caregiver. I mean, I think a lot of people are familiar with treating and uh, or being a caregiver for a parent with Alzheimer's, right. something like that. And it, it's a 24-7 job. Um, yeah. I'll go to work some days on two hours of sleep. Mm -hmm. and, you know, just because I've been up all night with her, so. We also have a younger daughter who is, is 12, going on 13, and, <laughs> um, you know, she's been just a wonderful little sister, to, but it's almost like she's the big sister right. a lot of times. She, she's a big help with her, but it's, it's hard on her, too. She, her sleep gets disrupted, and um, a lot of things that normal families get to do, we don't get to do. Right, and that's tough on her because we can't go to Holiday World as a family. We can't, right. and a lot of times we eat, because it's hard to find people to, to sit with our older daughter mm -hmm. for more than a few hours at a time. Mm -hmm. It's not like we can take our younger daughter on a weekend trip somewhere. Mm -hmm. So she misses out on a lot that, that normal mm -hmm. children right. do. But I guess we've adapted in our own yeah. strange way. We do have some really good <laughs> friends. We, uh, we don't have family in town, but we have really good friends that uh, can help us out at times. But we can't you know, rely on just anybody because she is an adult now, exactly. fully grown and able-bodied. It has to be someone who can physically handle mm -hmm. her. Now, she's never been able to go to school or, or no. a special school? No, she, she does attend um, McCracken County High School and uh, Janet, want to she talk? Has, yeah, she's been, oh, in this, okay. she's been in the McCracken County School System from, you know, uh, first steps, uh, the Head Start program all the mm -hmm. way through and uh, we've had some wonderful teachers. Uh, she started out with resource classes but it became apparent by the time she was in middle school that she needed more intensive uh, treatment in the classroom so she is in what they call FMD unit with it was small for children who aren't able to be in a regular classroom okay. and right now she's at McCracken County High School doing really well. FMD is functionally mentally disabled? Yes. Okay, that's wonderful. So the school's been pretty accommodating. They have worked pretty well with us. There have been ups and downs along the way, but right now we're in a really good situation with the best teachers around, I think. Yeah, autism has become a lot more prevalent in the last few years. Um, when Grace was diagnosed 16 years ago, there were not as many children diagnosed with autism, so it was sort of new to the school system. So it was a bit of struggle on both ends at first. Mm -hmm. um, Autism is very prevalent now. I think our next guest, Chrissy Ramey, will talk a little bit more in detail about that. But, you know, you see various statistics. Uh, it's as many as one in 45 boys. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so it's, it's becoming a lot more prevalent. And it's not all related to just better diagnosis. So something's going on in our environment. Genetic mutations are something that's causing it to be a much bigger problem. Mm -hmm. Is there a community of individuals here that mm -hmm. offer support? There is now. <laughs> There, what, when I, we were I know first, Christy's going to talk about that. Yes, bit, we, when we were first dealing with it, there not as much, um, mm. you know, connection between families who were dealing with it. It's a lot better in this area now than it was. Oh, that's good. Um, but we're just growing, you know. Yeah, and it, it, one thing that's difficult when you're a parent of a disabled child of any sort, whether it's a mental or physical, a lot of times you feel isolated because people would often say, "Well, aren't there support groups you can go to?" Well, yes and no. You can't leave your child alone, so. It, it's difficult to get out, right. so you do feel isolated in many ways. We can't attend church together. Um, autism is such an odd and strange disorder that even your own family members early on don't believe that it's happening. And a lot of a very common complaint among autistic parents is maybe in-laws or other relatives will just say, well, if you just discipline the child yeah. more, he or yeah. she would be all right. Right. And they can't understand the fact that no matter what kind of discipline you're doing, it's not going it, to extinguish a behavior that they feel compelled to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, it, any of normal people sometimes will have small compulsions that they make. It's, it's just amplified 
with a child. So, you know, right. a child that might bite himself or a child that might scream mm -hmm. out in public, you know, it's not bad behavior. It's just a, it's a neurological disorder that they can't control. Now, there are um, various treatments that if they're given to children when they're young can be very helpful. There's one called uh, applied behavioral analysis and uh, there, there's an actual analyst in town now that's able to work with people. Oh, wonderful. So if you, you, know, if you can get your child help at an early age, um, then the outcomes can be a lot, a lot better. I think and with our daughter, it probably wouldn't have mattered. Really at any age, um, you know, they can benefit from behavioral techniques. And I didn't mean to say there's <laughs> nothing you can do. There are right. behavioral techniques, but it's, I'm talking traditional discipline typically right, does not work exactly. with these children. I, that's that sounds odd to me that someone would say that mm -hmm. when there's something going on in, in the brain. It's kind of a denial. You, and you, did, you discipline them for that. It's what they call an invisible disability because mm -hmm. they, they look fine. There, there can't be anything wrong. You, know? it's, you must be doing something wrong. But I was going to ask you about, uh, you said treatment. Is the treatment expensive? It, it can be, yes. And there's a big somewhat controversy I guess in the nation now about how much insurance should be forced to pay for a lot of these things. We were able to get our daughter on Kentucky Medicaid which mm -hmm. helps pay for uh, the medications that she's on. Mm -hmm. She is currently taking four prescription medications right now so as you, as you can imagine that would be quite expensive if you had to right. pay for that privately. Right. Right. Uh, some of the behavioral therapies can be can be quite expensive as well. Are there people in Western Kentucky that specialize in Cognitive disabilities. Mm -hmm. such as that. There's a do uh, Dr. Becky Nastali, and uh, her she has a uh, company called Bloom Behavioral Therapy. She's new in town, and um, Chrissy can probably talk a little bit more about that later. She's she's the first uh, certified behavioral therapist in the Paducah area. So, okay. you know, again with us, when Grace was diagnosed in 1996, there really wasn't any of right. this available. So, and, and we still take her out of town to see a specialist. We went to Vanderbilt for years and we've just started going to Louisville. That's that's a, another good reason why I'm glad we're doing this show mm -hmm. because it brings a light to uh, these disabilities that are existing. Mm -hmm. And yes, if we were out in the restaurant, I'm sure and if the child was mm -hmm. making noises, somebody would say or look, why don't they shut that kid up? Right. Mm -hmm. Right. But Again, it's just being different mm -hmm. sure. and knowing how to work around that mm -hmm. just because you're different. And typically, if, if we were in a restaurant or the mall or, or someplace, which we really don't go to the mall much anymore, but if she started the vocal tics or the rocking, and, mm -hmm. and people will look, you know, they're curious. Sure. They'll, they'll look, but, uh, you know, over the, over the years, a lot of people have been really kind and accommodating, and I think as um, word gets out more about autism and more light is shed on it, people are a little more understanding now that when you see somebody acting that way, it isn't always just bad behavior. Right. And I think the Maneos brought a, a good point, too, when they said people just don't understand. Mm -hmm. Right. People look because they just don't understand. Now, when you're the parent, you feel... It, you know, you feel people looking at you and, yes. and, and you want to protect your child and right. it's uncomfortable. Exactly. Uh, but, you know, over the years we have adapted to it and adjusted. Do you have any suggestions for other parents that might have uh, autistic children on dealing with the public? And, and well, in, in general, there are a lot more resources now than there used to be. Um, the the, the uh, group that Chrissy heads up is called Families on the Spectrum. If you'll just Google Families on the Spectrum, Paducah, their website has a lot of resources. Um, and so there is a lot of hope now for, for younger children. Mm -hmm. um, as far as how to deal with the public, it's difficult. <laughs> what can I, you do? It's difficult. I mean, you almost you develop just, your own answers. Just over the years, you just almost have to, to grow a really thick skin. I mean, right. my, mm -hmm. my daughter loves to ride in a car, so I'll drive all over, all over the place with her, and she's constantly rocking in the back. Uh -huh. So I, I get a lot of stares at red lights, but, you know, or, or people at a grocery store when she was younger, and we take her out, you know, what's wrong with her? And, Mm -hmm. I always had a smart aleck response prepared, but yeah. I would try to bite my tongue and <laughs> let it go. Um, for, some, for her not to know somebody, if I were to go up to, up to your daughter and say, hey, how you doing, or just hug on her or mm -hmm. love on her, is she very receptive to that? How, how would someone handle that? Um, she's not a hugger. Okay. Typically, um, and some of them are. It's, it's you know they'll they'll say autistic children don't like to be touched. Some of them do, 
Um, it, typically, it's okay to ask a parent, is it okay if mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. speak to them? Some of them are uncomfortable with it, but a lot of times if you just speak to her gently, mm -hmm. say, hi, Grace, um, and she'll, you know, she'll respond to that. So she, I, I assume they just have their, it's not, they're not in a, just a box, the autistic box. They have a different personality. Oh, well, sure. They're and, just and like anyone else. So yeah. If you've seen one child with autism, you've seen one child with autism. It's, exactly. It's, you know, they all are different. It's very much a spectrum, again, the higher function children you, know, you you wouldn't want to talk about them like they're not there I mean they're certainly mm -hmm. able to mm -hmm. understand you know so many of them can um, understand more than they're able to show that they understand with grace you wouldn't hurt her feelings if you talked about her you know but um, with higher functioning children you might so that we yeah. know of so, kind of, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say so they do understand it's just that the matter of communicating back to you with grace I'm yes. convinced that she understands but she just can't make the connection yes to, to communicate it back. So you can imagine how frustrating it would be for a child if you're hungry, right. tired, want to change clothes. They, they have a lot of sensory issues, so maybe their mm -hmm. shirts are uncomfortable, but they can't communicate it, so right. that results in a lot of the behavior issues. Right. Yeah, a lot of times they'll, she'll wind up repeating something that doesn't make any sense when she really just wants a glass of water. She mm -hmm. might say something mm -hmm. else completely off the wall. And I mean, that's what I suspect is going on with her, and she will sure. get very frustrated because what she wants to say is not coming out in the right way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What kind of things does Grace enjoy? She loves music um, and she just listens to what I listen to which is older rock music. So, she, <laughs> <laughs> so Our so younger daughter calls it old people music. Old people music so, <laughs> and old and people she music. loves to ride in a car so I uh, spend a lot of time driving my car mm -hmm. around Western Kentucky and Southern <laughs> Illinois listening to music. Mm -hmm. um, but um, you know, other than that, I mean, she, we, we were able to take her to Disney World when she was younger, and she oh. loved a lot of the rides oh, right? yeah. because, wow. of, the, because of, of the motion, and, and Disney was very accommodating. We put her in a wheelchair, and they, they were very accommodating. So mm -hmm. she, she loved the teacup ride, which made me sick, but oh. Oh, no. being the good father that I am, I did it about 30 <laughs> times. Yeah, we had life. to ride it like 100 <laughs> times, and we had to trade off because we would both get so sick. Yeah. <laughs> so she, again, she would want to go again and again. So. So, you know what, though, uh, Bob, you do have a very good... Uh, comical personality. I mean, he's so comical, and that's yes. got to help. It oh, has yes. to help because I believe your house is probably live. Oh yeah, with Grace and Bob. Yeah, <laughs> I believe it's live at your house. Oh, it is, and I'll have to say that a sense of humor. If you don't have a sense of humor, and and you're dealing with what we're dealing with, get one. Yes, you have to have a sense yes. of humor. Yes. Yes. Well, do we have any? I think you guys have talked about this. And you've done a very good job, and it, I found it in, enlightening. Um, I didn't know that a lot of times people with autis autism do understand, but they just can't communicate back. Sure, sure. And, and it's, that's, it's sad. That's, that's enlightening to me. Yeah, yeah. And that's the saddest thing to me as a parent, knowing that there's a real person in there that mm -hmm. just exactly. can't just come can't out. Come out. So it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's yeah. sad. It's mm -hmm. sad and frustrating. Yes. But again, I feel I, we, I feel like I've focused on the negative. But again, with our daughter, she's on the severe end. So right. Um, just, you know, and a lot of people will forget that with media portrayals of how easy it looks or I'm how, you how that it's just up. mildly. Yes. Um, they're just a little bit different, and uh, mm -hmm. many of them are. Mm -hmm. But then you can't forget about the ones. And this is why research is so necessary. Yes. Um, research into we still don't know exactly what it is or what causes it. And many are severely disabled, and we as a society are going to have to take care of these people as they come into adulthood, right. like our daughter has. Right. So uh, it's really important right now, I think, to focus on the research side of it. Right. Um, well, I really appreciate you guys coming yeah. on the show. This has ver been very enlightening to me. Sure. Thanks for giving us Thank the, you. Uh, the forum. To yes. And we are going to be back with uh, Families on the Spectrum. That's right. And we appreciate you guys. And that video is, is quite interesting, I'm sure, and it's enlightening. Um, so tune in. We'll be right back. Okay. Welcome back. I'm Matthew Schultz. This is uh, the Particular Human Rights Commission's show, Raising the Standard. I'm assisting Shalorin Jeter as our co-host, and uh, we're here today with Chrissy Ramey. She's president of Families on the Spectrum, and as you know, uh, Particular Human Rights Commission is responsible for uh, representing and providing resources to individuals facing discrimination in the areas of 
gender, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, uh, or disability or special needs, as we call it. And um, we're here today with Chrissy from Families on the Spectrum. We got a few questions for her. Chrissy, welcome, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm very glad to be here today. And so you're a president of Families on the Spectrum, is that right? Yes, yes. Okay. We, I, myself and Christina Hasty, a uh, fellow autism mom, we started the group um, in October of last year. So we're 12 months old almost. Okay. So what prompted you to start this group? Um, my oldest son um, is almost 11 and he has autism. Um, and there was nothing here. Um, absolutely nothing here. You know, there's nowhere to turn, nowhere to go, nobody to call. And when you get an autism diagnosis, you seek out other families, you seek out other right. parents. And, you know, so I've done that over the years and built some friendships and it needed to be more than just a friendship. It needed to be more than one person that I could call, more than, you know, one mom, one friend. Right. And so Christina and I um, took a really big mission and we made it our baby and um, we've grown it and it's grown tremendously beyond what her and I ever thought that it would be. But um, it's turned out to be a huge blessing for her and for I, um, emotional healing. Wow. I get a lot from what we're doing as a group. Um, and I'm hoping that we're giving to other families what we haven't had throughout the years um, in our journeys with autism. So what is the mission of Families on the Spectrum? As I look at my notes here, <laughs> but I already remember that question. Um, you know, our, our mission is really to raise awareness of what autism is, um, to give parents a place of hope and love and acceptance. Um, like, you know, Bob and Janet were talking, is when you have a child with autism, they don't look different. And so you don't go out into public and get those, you know, pitiful looks and those, right. oh, I'm so sorry, and those, you know, touches of I'm praying for you, like you do when you see a child with their head shaved because they've lost all their hair with cancer. Mm -hmm. We don't get that emotional connection from strangers. And so we need that emotional connection from other people. And we, our biggest thing is acceptance, awareness and acceptance. Those are the two things that we absolutely push is awareness and acceptance. What's the significance of the name, Families on the Spectrum? Um, autism is a spectrum disorder. You can be on the high functioning end, you can be on the low functioning end, and you can be everywhere in between. Um, my son Derek, when he was initially diagnosed with autism, um, he was moderately to severely affected by autism. He didn't speak until he was five. Mm -hmm. He wasn't potty trained until he was almost six. Um, we had major you know, behavior issues, meltdowns. Um, you know, I had a stranger one day carry him out of Walmart for me because we were having a meltdown in the milk aisle and I couldn't do it on my own. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so at one point in time, I would say Derek was severely affected by autism. We were fortunate um, in our lives that we had some opportunities to travel for services and for therapies. And he started a recovery process um, about the age of six. And so now Derek is on the high functioning end of the spectrum and we can go places, we can do things um, as a typical family. And he still has a lot of social issues, quirks. He doesn't understand um, how to carry on social interaction with people, whether it's somebody he knows or a stranger. Mm -hmm. um, he doesn't understand appropriate behaviors, appropriate um, just instances, like things that people would get, just typical life scenarios. He doesn't understand those in any way, shape or form. Um, you know, and then you have the situations like Janet and Bob's where their daughter is severe and there's things that she may never do. Um, and so there's, it's all over the place and there's everything in between my son and Grace. So it's about I'm sorry. Do, now does he go to school? Derek does go to school. Um, okay. He is in a general education classroom. He's mainstream is what they call it. Um, he does get um, what they call um, minutes uh, of collaboration. He gets a one-on-one -on -one instructor that comes into the classroom and helps him in the areas that he struggles with. Um, but academically, Derek excels in math. He's about a grade and a head um, of, you know, academically in math. Wow. Um, his struggles are English language. Mm -hmm. um, he can read, he can write, he can do all of those things, but simple things like when you go through reading and you have to restate the question to give an answer. Like to him, it's stupid to restate the question because you've already read the question, you know what the question is, so why can't I just give the answer? I can relate. And you know, I mean, he's, he's made some Fs on some papers strictly mm -hmm. because he doesn't want to restate the question. And like those are those little quirky things, you know, that come with autism. Okay. Um, so 
how is this a challenge for you? Are you are you married or? Yes, okay. I am married. Um, I am remarried. I went through a um, a divorce. Mm -hmm. um, there was a lack of acceptance um, of autism, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, created some problems that created bigger problems. Right. Um, but I have uh, been remarried since Derek was six, um, and my husband has been a huge part. Very good. Of Derek's recovery process. Wow, that's wonderful. He's a gem. It sounds like he's a gem. Yeah, he is. That's for sure. That's absolutely for sure. He, um, I try to give him a lot of credit because he <laughs> deserves it. It's definitely not something that I could have done alone. Uh -huh. And what's his name? Aaron Ramey is my Aaron husband. Aaron Ramey. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. So, okay, this Families of the Spectrum, it's only been uh, going for 12 months. Mm -hmm. Now, do you have a physical building or? That is what we are trying to achieve right now. Um, as Families on the Spectrum, we do monthly outings. We do Mom's Day Out, Dad's Day Out. Um, we're constantly getting together and doing things. We do um, monthly meetings every single month. We do family outings, mom, dad, brother, sister, okay. siblings, aunts, uncles, grandma, grandpa. Now what's mom's day out? Do you take care of the kids while mom go out or? Well, t our husbands do. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> Grandmas do, grandpas do, it just depends. Um, you know, we and we just, like for Mother's Day, um, we put on our derby hats and our pretty dresses and we went downtown and we did canvas painting and wine tasting. Oh, um, nice. And we went out to dinner, you know, that night. And, and the guys, they go out to eat. They go watch football games. It's just getting people together and sharing stories. I mean, the first time I sent my husband off for a dad's day, he actually came home and was like, well, so-and-so's kid does this and so-and-so's kid does that. And I was like, you all actually talked about autism? And he was like, yeah, the whole time. And like, that's something that parents don't get the opportunity to do, to do is right. to talk candidly about how autism affects their life. Right, right. So we, um, you know, as Families on the Spectrum, we announced um, August the 22nd, our, um, our big dream, our big initiative, our big vision um, to build the West Kentucky Autism Center. Um, a lot of our parents are driving to Louisville, to Lexington, to Bowling Green, to, you know, Vanderbilt to, for services, for treatments, for specialists, for physicians. Right. We don't have those opportunities here in Paducah. Mm -hmm. They're not available. We have, um, you know, an ABA therapist that has a fairly new practice. Um, you know, she is amazing, cannot sing her praises enough. Um, but other than Dr. Nastali, we're very limited as to what we have here. Um, Hampton Physical Therapy, they have a sensory integration program, but they have a really long waiting list and they only take certain insurances and, and a certain number of, you know, Medicaid children. Wow. Most children with autism um, have a form of Medicaid, whether it's traditional income-based Medicaid or Medicaid waiver, which is a waiver program based on disability. Um, and so we just don't have, you know, mm -hmm. we don't mm -hmm. have. and that became extremely prevalent to me when I started this group. You know, parents were seeing my son and how well he's doing. Well, what did you do? Where did you go? Exactly. And so when I have to say, well, we went to Florida. You know, we go to Bowling Green, we go to Louisville, we right. go to Nashville. A lot of parents can't afford to do that. They can't take off work exactly. to go and do that. It's gas, it's travel, it's expenses, it's hard on the kids. And we just kind of said, we can do this mm -hmm. and we're going to do it. So we're actively fundraising. We're actively looking for properties, talking to contractors. Um, we will get there. Our goal is October 2015 to have our doors open. That'd be wonderful. It will be. It That'd will be. be. Wonderful. Have you decided on any location for the center? Have you looked at places? You said you have we, some, we some are ideas looking, out there. We are dealing um, with a local businessman right now um, with the 20,000 square foot facility that he has. Um, Negotiating, mm -hmm. Good. very heavily negotiating. They're negotiating. Nothing else. Nothing else needs <laughs> to be said. <laughs> yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. We'll let you uh, work on that on your own time. You seem pretty well organized. We we are, and as soon as we have that physical address to announce, mm. we're going to say it. I right. mean, we're oh, going to yeah, sure. before the, it's even ready. You know, we're going to open the doors and say this is what it is, right. and this is what it's going to need to be turned into. We're going to need help. You know, right. we're going to need a lot of help. We're going to need some local contractors to step in, offer man hours, offer materials. Right. We're going to need the community to come in, paint some walls, tear some walls out. Right. And I mean, it's going to be a community effort to make this happen. I think the help will be there. I, I, I pray every day. I, I found in Paducah a lot of uh, organizations and business, they do help. And hit those realtors up. Uh, come to the Realtor Luncheon. I'm mm -hmm. inviting you now. So. Okay, I will take you up on that. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, I think the help will be there once you get that building. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times we, we wonder, why did this happen to me? Or why did this happen to my kid? Perhaps this happened to your kid or happened to you because 
something like this was needed. Mm -hmm. And somebody thought, we don't want to get too religious on here, but somebody, some, something thought yeah. you were the woman for the job. You know, it's hard when you get that diagnosis, figuring uh -huh. out where your place is as a parent, as a mom, um, as an advocate. Because as exactly. soon as you get that diagnosis, you have to immediately start advocating for your child, for your child's future. Mm -hmm. And um, this was not what I chose for myself. Sure, sure. And I, you know, I have, uh, I went to nursing school. You know, that is what I should be doing and right. I don't. And I've held, um, you know, I owned a business here locally. And I got out of that in February of this year uh -huh. and focused all of my time and energy into this group, into developing this group and developing the West Kentucky Autism Center. It is a full-time job that I don't get oh, paid yes. for, oh, yes. but I am fortunate that my husband is mm -hmm. able to support us as a family so that I can go and open these doors and open these opportunities for these families, these kids, these mm -hmm. parents. And the barrier that I'm finding in raising money is people don't understand what autism is, what the struggles of autism are, and how there is a lack of services, lack of providers, lack of specialties, lack of support system in this area. I mean, you say, you know, well, I have a child with autism. Well, do you go here? Do you go there? Well, I can't. They don't take my kid. They don't service my kid. They don't help. And it's hard, you know, to right. spend days upon days on the phone begging to be moved up in waiting list and begging to be seen by this professional mm -hmm. and having to figure out where the money is going to come from to privately pay for some of these services because your insurance doesn't pay for it. I mean, we're talking with state legislators right now, state senators, about proposing different things in Frankfurt to help our families, you know, be able to acquire services to make insurances pay for things. There's a big gap in what they have to pay for, what they refuse to pay for, and what our kids need. I mean, even evidence-based practices like applied behavioral analysis or ABA, that wasn't mandated by insurance to be paid for until 2010. Wow. You know, so I mean, we're growing, we're moving forward nationally, but we need to move forward locally right. as well. This, again, I cannot say enough. I'm so glad we're doing this type of show because this is very good information. and um, I didn't realize this was going on. Yeah, do you think that, uh, um, the uh, Affordable Care Act has helped expand those services at all, or do you think it's... Im Let's get the politics. <laughs> <laughs> <Go ahead>. um, <laughs> personally, um, it has not helped my family. Mm -hmm. um, it has actually hindered my family. Mm -hmm. um, the way that our private insurance was, um, our yearly expense, our yearly premium, tripled. Wow. Our out of pocket went from being a set standard copay to like I paid three, six, nine, or 12 for medications. Um, my kid takes a ton of medicine. He has a blood disorder, he has autism, uh, he has some hematology issues, gastrointestinal issues. We see specialists in Nashville all the time. Mm -hmm. We see neurologists in Louisville all the time. Those visits for me used to be $12. Every time I would take him to a specialist, it was $12. Now I, and I didn't have a huge deductible. I had $1,000 I had to meet as a family every year. Now we have an individual deductible of $1,000 per person, oh my goodness. plus a 20% out of pocket copay that wow. I didn't have before. Wow. And they've limited the number of providers that I can use. So that's my personal story. Mm -hmm. It could have helped somebody else that didn't have the same situation that I had. But for me personally, <laughs> Uh, my medical expenses from 2010 to 2012 really went up significantly, almost $3,000 out of pocket. Wow. I know you said you've been talking to state legislators. What do you think they could do to, to help the situation, either on the, you know, uh, health care side or um, you know, I'm not asking for anything radical. You know, I'm not asking for Affordable Care Act to be repealed, you know, or anything like that. That's that's beyond, um, you know, conversations that I can have. But, I'll just um, steer this conversation totally <laughs> in the way of politics. Anyway. But it's okay. Proceed. But we, um, it, like speech therapy, occupational therapy, physical therapy, those services are mandated by the state government to be right. provided in a school setting, to be provided by insurance companies. Those things are mandated by the state. We are asking for applied behavioral analysis therapy to be mandated by the state, to be provided in a school setting, to be provided by private insurance, right, right. to be provided by Medicaid. Right. There was actually some legislative um, stuff that was coming through. Kentucky was going to adopt um, for EPSDT or Medicaid, Medicaid waiver, to pay for ABA services. And it kind of got held up in committee. And so it's not going to be voted on until February of 2015 when regular session comes back. 
but that's a huge piece of legislation that could positively impact hundreds, if not thousands of families in the state of Kentucky and their, and their kids. Right. Now, do you have um, any other kids? Is it just your son? We have four children. Um, okay. My oldest son has autism. Um, my seven-year-old um, is just, he's a different quirky kid. <laughs> um, he was three. Derek was three when Kevin was born, and we were in the trenches of autism at right. that time. And so from the time that Kevin was a newborn baby until the time he was two, um, there's not a lot that I remember. Right. Um, Derek was a daily battle. I mean, mm -hmm. an absolute mm -hmm. daily battle. I didn't leave the house by myself. If I didn't take two people with me, I didn't go anywhere. And even when we did go places, it was horrible. I mean, I would come home and cry for hours. You know, why did that person stare at me? And why did they say that ugly thing? And right. do they not understand that my child doesn't want to act the way that he's acting? He right. just can't communicate his wants, his needs. And so when he wanted that gallon of milk in Walmart and couldn't tell me and he threw himself out of the cart and was slamming eggs down on the floor and a guy walked up to me and said, my grandson has autism, let me help you. Wow. Like That is what I want to do with this group is to raise awareness in this community mm -hmm. that that kid throwing a fit at Rafferty's or at Walmart or at Kmart is not just a bad kid that needs a spanking. These are kids that suffer every day because they have lack of communication, they have lack of behavior support, they can't control those things. And so like Kevin, I kind of feel like my seven year old kind of didn't get a lot of attention <laughs> that he should have gotten because being in the trenches of autism took my time away from him. Right. And you know, so now that he's seven, he's doing a little attention seeking. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, so we've got some, some roads that we're going down with sure, him with I'm that. Sure. But we also have um, a four year old and a two year old. Um, my two-year-old is my only little girl, so she is oh. absolutely rotten. But um, <laughs> my other children are mostly typical. You know, we all have our quirks and things, but Derek is my only child that has autism. Now, so, do th I'm sorry. You're fine. Uh, <laughs> so if people do want to get involved and help and contribute, you know, uh, I don't know, contracting services or financially, yeah. Yeah. where do they go? Who do they contact? Are you the contact person? How do um, they get a hold They of you? can contact me. They can go through our website, uh, familiesonthespectrumky.org. Um, okay. There's donate buttons on there through PayPal, so it's all safe and secure. And okay. um, we do have a GoFundMe page that's floating mm -hmm. around um, also. Our first goal in fundraising right now is $100,000. Okay. Um, we feel that's where we need to, to be to meet the construction needs of the facility that we're looking at. Um, it's going to go above and beyond $100,000, um, sure. well above and beyond. But for us, that's phase one. Right. Do you, now, do you have a Facebook page as well? We do. We have a Facebook page. Um, Families on the Spectrum uh, KY, facebook.com backslash Families on the Spectrum KY. Okay. Um, very active. We are constantly doing something, posting something. We try to give resource referral um, autism facts you know, daily on our Facebook right. page. Um, our website has resources. If you click on our resources tab, it's a huge drop box of all the local resources, all of the national resources, Louisville, Lexington, Vanderbilt, St. Louis, all of that is linked through our page. We kind of try to be a hub to link, you know, everybody all together. Um, we bring professionals into our monthly meetings, you know, every month to talk about different things and, and to teach us, to educate us as parents. Wow. So we're, I mean, we're extremely active, sometimes a little too active. <laughs> we wear ourselves out, but it's needed. I mean, these parents, these kids, these siblings need a place to go. And for me, the reward is at the end of the day, with this group doing family outings, you know, mm -hmm. my typical children are able to see that their brother is not just crazy. He's not just weird. He's not sure. just different. There are other children like him. Right. And about two weeks ago, my seven-year-old and I, we were out, you know, catting around and there was this kid in the floor of Kroger throwing a fit, screaming, crying, kicking. And Kevin looked at me and said, Mommy, that kid probably has autism. Why don't you go and give her, you know, his mom a card? Wow. And it was like, he gets it. Yes. At seven years old, yes. he gets it. Yes. Well, Miss Ramey, we are so happy that you came on the show. Unfortunately, I wish we had had your husband on. <laughs> Next time we have to have him I on. I had as to leave well. somebody at home with the kids. <laughs> We appreciate you coming on to the show and Families on the Spectrum. Um, and we appreciate the Bloomberg, the Bloomingbirds and mm -hmm. the Maneos. Just because we're different doesn't mean we're in a box or no. you just stare or you just look and judge. People are just different. And I think that was that's really what we want to do is just raise some awareness that people are just different and that and that there's real problems out there. There's real issues going on. Um, Commissioner Schultz, I appreciate you coming on to the show. Happy to and help you.
we are getting ready to sign off. Unfortunately, I have enjoyed the conversation. I today. have enjoyed being here today. I, I truly appreciate the opportunity. Thanks. We'll see you again on Raising the Standard.